South Korea is the place of neon-lit skyscrapers, the hugely successful K-pop music genre, Oscar-winning movies, and hit Netflix series like The Squid Game. In a relatively short time, South Korea has gone from being an Asian country that nobody cared about to being a soft powerhouse. And no, we aren't only talking about its culture, we're also talking about its industry. It's likely that many of you are watching this video on a Samsung phone, or perhaps on an LG screen. Both Korean companies that, by the way, have enormous political influence internationally. For example, we've often explained the importance of semiconductors in Taiwan, and the conflicts that this sector provokes between China and the US. Well, to give you an idea, apart from Taiwan, South Korea is the only country that can manufacture state-of-the-art semiconductors. Semiconductors that not even the USA is capable of manufacturing. However, visual economic community. If instead of talking about Korea right now, we were talking about it 50 years ago, the story would be very, very different from today. In fact, 50 years ago, South Korea was so miserable that its standard of living was similar to that of sub-Saharan African countries as poor as Nigeria. So given all this, the big question is, what did South Korea do to grow so much and so fast? What was the secret that led it to become such a technological and cultural powerhouse? Today on Visual Economic, we tell you all about it, so stay tuned. The history of Korea is anything but boring. You see, before the two countries we know today existed, Korea was colonized by the Empire of Japan. In fact, it was then that Korea really began to split, because among the supporters of independence from Japan, not everyone was of the same mind. There were some who were pro-US, and others who were pro-Soviet Union. In the end, what happened is what you all know. To avoid yet another world war, after the end of World War II, it was decided to divide Korea into two antagonistic halves. But was it really a good idea to split the country into two halves more at odds than cats and dogs, well, there are opinions for all tastes. The reality is that just two years after dividing the country, the pro-Soviet North invaded the pro-American South. They engaged in a savage civil war, which ultimately ended practically as it began, with the countries equally divided with almost the same borders. That is, a socialist North Korea and a capitalist South Korea. Be that as it may, the point is that after the war, South Korea ended up economically shattered, and the US initiated a series of reforms to revive the country economically. And yes, yes, I know what many of you are thinking. Here comes another video about how a country adopted US-style market economy, opened its country wide to foreign companies, lowered taxes, and started privatizing state-owned companies like crazy. Well, no. In fact, what happened in South Korea was quite the opposite. The success story of the South Korean model stems from the central role of the state in directing the economy, a very high degree of protectionism, and an almost non-existent foreign investment, far below even countries like Malaysia or China. And of course, given this, I'm sure one question pops into your head. How could it be that the United States promoted an anti-free market model? Well, the answer is simply that it did not. In fact, the US was in charge of South Korea for a very short time, and it didn't have time to implement its policies. Instead, in 1960, this man, an army general named Park Chung-hee, staged a coup d'etat and established a military dictatorship that shaped the country's economic destiny. And let's see, the truth is that although General Park remained an important ally of the United States following the coup, he ended up being famous for despising its economic development advice, for despising the free market. So the question is, what did General Park's new economic plan consist of? And how did this dictator make South Korea rich? Well, let's take a look. A question of land. When General Park came to power, he realized one thing. South Korea had a huge problem with inequality, and above all, with the distribution of land ownership. Until then, the country had practically a feudal system based on agriculture, and the rich, large landowners owned the vast majority of arable land. South Korea had the most unequal land distribution in the region, where, to give you an idea, just 4% of the population owned more than 50% of the land. The point is that General Park wanted to put an end to this inequality, and to do so, he carried carried out an agrarian rationalization. That is, he expropriated the land of the rich and distributed it among the rest of the population. After that, ordinary South Korean families went from owning 10% of the land to 70%. However, all this had a second great advantage besides ending inequality. You see, in quasi-feudal systems such as Korea or pre-industrial Europe, when land is concentrated in very few hands, the lack of competition, innovation, incentives for landowners, or simple flexibility in the choice 
choice of crops leads to lower productivity. In that sense, an agricultural rationalization can boost the productivity of rural areas. And that's exactly what happened in South Korea. After rationalization, rice production per hectare increased from 3 to more than 5 tons, an improvement in productivity significantly higher than that of neighboring countries during the same period. However, don't imagine that General Park's economic strategy ended here, as the land reform was only the first piece of a much more developed plan to bring wealth to the country. Want to know what plan we're talking about? Stay tuned. At your service, General. There's a rule in economics that is practically unbreakable. If a poor country wants to become rich, it needs industry and more industry. Factories, manufacturing, they are much more profitable than farming. They are a direct pass to wealth and trade with other countries. Of course, General Park realized this, and his economic takeoff plan consisted precisely of supporting local industry, more specifically, the Shebols. You see, in South Korea and in other Asian countries like Japan, large companies operate quite differently than in the US or Europe. In the West, we're used to seeing large companies that focus on very specific things. For example, Coca-Cola is soft drinks, Microsoft is software, and Volkswagen is vehicles. However, now think of a large Korean company. Let's take Samsung, for example. Samsung manufactures air conditioners, cell phones, televisions, microchips, watches, washing machines, and let's see, it even produces ships. Yes, Samsung is the second largest shipbuilder in the world. Yes, I know, that's crazy. In any case, the point is that the reason these conglomerates it's called Shables are so successful today is because General Park supported them with all the forces of his government. The question is, how did he do it? Well, do you remember that in the agrarian rationalization, many lands were expropriated from the rich? It turns out that much of that land not only was distributed to the poor, but was also used to support the Shebols. For example, if a large company needed railroad infrastructure to move its merchandise more easily, it was done. The land was used and the railroad track was built. Did the company want to build a new factory to produce more? No problem. The government would put the land needed at its disposal. But pay attention because this is not the end of the story. As we have said, agrarian rationalization helped to increase the productivity of the farmland. This meant that the government was able to collect much more taxes than before, and that allowed it to do two things. The first was to subsidize large companies, and the second was to lower those companies' taxes so that they would grow even more. As you can see, agricultural rationalization was key to the development of General Park's industrial plan. But besides aid and land distribution, there was still one last big push that ended up triggering South Korean industry. Listen up. Watering with interest, you see, at the end of the Korean War and following US advice, the South Korean government privatized much of its financial sector. Do you remember that Park was not in agreement with the US? This measure did not please General Park, who nationalized the banks again when he came to power. And believe me, the new Korean Central Bank, along with the other banks, were anything but independent. The government did not hesitate for a second to put all its financial muscle at the service of big business. And how did it do that? On the one hand, the government started to shower the shables with loans at an interest rate of between minus 15 and minus 20%. Yes, yes, just as you heard, negative interest rates. That is, state-owned banks paid large companies for getting into debt. On the other hand, the government also limited credit for the rest of the small businesses and individuals. As a result, most of the money could be directed only to business conglomerates. To give you an idea, in the 1970s, the three largest shables each accounted for 10% of the country's total credit. If we compare that figure with Taiwan, a country not unlike like South Korea, it needed to bring together its 330 largest companies to add up to the same percentage of credit held by only the three largest companies in South Korea. Pretty mind-blowing, don't you think? All the potential of the state at the service of the Shebolds. However, wait a minute, because as you can imagine, not everything is so rosy in this whole story. Between loans at negative rates, subsidies of all kinds, and tax breaks, the cost to the government of supporting the Shebols skyrocketed. The cost was so high that it simply could not be paid with taxes. And you may ask, if it wasn't paid for with taxes, how was it paid? The answer is with the legendary technique of printing banknotes. But of course, as you will know, printing banknotes in a crazy way causes inflation. As a result, ordinary citizens ended up suffering annual inflation rates of 15% in the 1960s and 1990s. 
1970s. We could say that, in general, Park's entire industrial mega plan ended up being paid for by the citizens through worse living conditions. Taxes in South Korea were mostly regressive. The poor paid more taxes than the rich, but social benefits were also very low. As you can see in this graph, this was reflected in the fact that the weight of social spending as a percentage of total taxes was exceptionally low. Now, as if this weren't enough, another thing to keep in mind is that, in South Korea, most unions, strikes, and labor demands were banned. This, again, served to give even more power to business conglomerates, and again, translated into worse living standards for South Koreans. Here, we're talking about marathon working hours, and above all, real wages that plummeted far below workers' productivity. Ultimately, Park's industrial model put long-term industrial growth before any social cost. Later, however, starting in the 1980s and 1990s, with the advent of democracy, South Korea transitioned back to a freer economic system, and all these social problems began to be solved. Even so, if you think about it, there's something in this whole story that doesn't quite add up. I mean, since when is giving money and privileges to companies a recipe for economic success? These types of privileges don't usually work. Privileges destroy competition, limit the creation of innovative companies, cause large companies to become parasites on government money, and give them no incentive to improve. Why did the aid work in the case of South Korea? Why didn't the companies become parasites of government money? Well, stay tuned, because here comes the most interesting part of all. The carrot and stick model Let's be clear, General Park knew very, very well that if he showered companies with money and privileged them without limit, they would end up becoming dangerous leeches. But to avoid that, he did a very interesting thing. He approved the Special Order Against Illicit Enrichment, a law that allowed the jailing of business elites who tried to live off public money instead of competing freely in the market. In fact, the head of the South Korean company LG ended up in prison for that very reason. This seems to clash quite a bit with what we've told you about the love affair between Park and the Shaybols, doesn't it? Well, not at all. The fact is that all the advantages that the government granted to the Shaybols came with one very important condition. The Shaybols had to export most of their goods to sell them in the international market. Companies had to compete and make money abroad. That way, they could not rest on their laurels or parasitize the state. As a result of this major incentive, the weight of exports in South Korea's GDP skyrocketed. What's more, the level of exports was the data used by the state to decide how much public money each company would receive. In other words, the more exports, the more favorably the government would behave toward you. And so, putting all these big businessmen in prison was a way of saying that the government was serious, that it would not hesitate to punish companies that tried to live off the government purse instead of competing freely in the international market. Or put another way, Park's strategy was carrot and stick. As long as you compete in the global market, I will finance you as much as you want. But the moment you become unproductive and no one outside Korea wants to buy what you produce, nothing will save you from bankruptcy or going to prison. Thus, there was a market mechanism that forced these giants to innovate and compete. In fact, contrary to how it might appear at first glance, these conglomerates turned out to be hugely dynamic. Most of the 10 largest shables went bankrupt or were forced to merge in just 10 years, and more than half of those that replaced them suffered the same fate over the next decade. Only Samsung has survived all these years. In other words, the companies were not parasites of the public sector. They needed to survive by their own means. Thanks to this carrot and stick technique, the South Korean economy boomed. At the end of the Korean War, South Korea had a per capita GDP lower than that of most Latin American countries, and similar to that of many African ones. 60 years later, it has caught up with the United Kingdom. Not surprisingly, the government also financed hundreds of useless projects and inefficient companies, and corruption was the order of the day. But it made sure to finance enough productive companies so that, under the competition of international markets, they could pull the whole economy upwards. In any case, it it should be noted that the South Korean model was designed to operate in a very specific context of economic development. It's not something that could be developed in all countries, nor in all eras, nor in more developed economies that require a large infrastructure of small and medium-sized enterprises, which in South Korea were practically non-existent. Be that as it may, at this point, it's now your turn. What do you think of South Korea's economic development model, and do you think it's a strategy that could be replicated in other countries? Which model would you opt for going forwards. You can leave me your answers down in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel, hit that little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you liked this video, please give it a like. All the best, and I'll see you next time.